This is the Good Neighbor Podcast, the place where local businesses and neighbors come together. Here's your host, Jeff Gardner. Welcome to another episode of the Good Neighbor Podcast. Today, we have another good neighbor on, Marcia Murray with the dog, Nanny. Marcia, welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Good morning to you, too. Okay, so... <clears throat> We want to know about you and your business. That's why the audience comes here. So let's start first with your business. What is the dog nanny, Marcia? I actually do group and private classes, dog training, canine obedience, and behavior modification. Wonderful. And what is the area you serve? Um, I'm in Innisfil, so all of Simcoe County. Wonderful. And so is there a location or do you work remotely? How does that work? So the group classes are all here at my facility, at the academy. And then when I'm working with my private clients, I always do the first session here so I can meet the dog on neutral territory. Mm -hmm. And then after that assessment and training session, we decide where's best to work, whether they continue to come here or I come to them or I meet them at Lakeshore and we work in that area. So that's how I work it. Wonderful. How long have you been doing this, Marcia? A very long time. Just Uh, by the tone of voice, I bet it is a very long time. (laughs) 40 years. 40 years? 40 years. Oh, my God. You're like the dog whisperer. So let me ask you. I had, um, I grew up with cats. Nothing wrong with cats. They just, I like dogs better. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) And um, I uh, got a couple of pugs. I'm a big fan of the short, stout, chubby uh, little dogs. Yep. Although I, I really just love animals. I love uh, pretty much all dogs, but I really love the pugs. And I got lucky. It seems that's what people told me. I did the training myself, which brand new to it. So I went on some YouTube videos and that seemed to be all they needed because <clears throat> they didn't get in garbage cans. They didn't pee or go to the washroom inside the house. They were pretty, they were pretty easy from what I've been told. That's my only experience with owning two dogs myself. Uh, I got them both from, you know, whatever it was, eight or nine weeks. So I got lucky is what I've been told. I didn't have to do a whole lot of training. They were pretty well behaved. But for uh, the rest of us out there that don't get as lucky as maybe I did, when do you start training a dog? Well, you can actually start training from the moment you pick them up. I mean, hopefully the breeder um, started some training. When I was breeding um, Dobermans and uh, later on Dobber Bordeaux's, I did actually keep them till they were about 12 weeks and I actually started their training. So I was working with puppies that are maybe four or five weeks old. Wow. Generally, um, most dog training schools or facilities will say that they have to be 10 to uh, 14 weeks because they have to have their second set of back seats to come to uh, a puppy class because they'll have enough immunity left over from mum. And then with the breed, it does the first set of vaccines. Four weeks later, the second set comes in. And then four weeks after that, the third and final set comes in. So, I mean, you don't want to take your puppy out to the dog park or out in the bush until they've had their third set. But if you're coming to a facility, um, you know that it's been cleaned, it's been sterilized before the puppies come in, so they're, they're okay to come in on second set of shots. So, the, sorry, remind me, when was the second set of shots again, like eight or nine weeks in? Uh, generally, the it depends when the breeder did the first because they're four weeks apart. So some breeders will do the first set at six weeks, some will do them at eight weeks when you pick them up or at seven in between. So those puppy shots come four weeks apart. So okay. the earliest would be, say, 10 weeks if they were vaccinated, first vaccine at six. And if they weren't vaccinated till they were eight weeks, then you're talking 12 weeks. So and you can start working with the puppies as long as they have their second vaccine. Yes, they can come to the to the academy as long as they've had their second set of vaccines. You don't have to wait for the third. OK, well, that's great. That four weeks makes a big difference. <laughs> oh, yeah, I bet. I bet. <clears throat> Um, I'm very curious. I'm going to ask you some some questions about it sure. uh, in and in, in later in the in the conversation, so I can learn a little bit more about it myself because I love dogs and I'm on the hunt for a French bulldog right now, and I want to be prepared for it. But before we get into that, 
There's a couple of really integral questions that we really like asking on the show. I find human beings fascinating, um, very interested in human potential, our story behind our, our um, experiences. I look at human beings as a vast, very, very large book. And I have found a lot of value from flipping through those pages by asking some of these questions. And one of the questions that's most valuable to me is why? Like, why do we do the things we do? Uh, there's a lot of um, there's just a lot of value to be gleaned from understanding why people do what they do. Uh, and they, we can, we can learn a lot about ourselves through that. So we like to ask the guests on the show, why did you get into this? I mean, it's been 40 years. That's going back quite some time, but why spend the vast majority of your life working with dogs? Is there, is there a story there, Marcia? Um, there is my, my mother, um, used to breed and raise, uh, Harlequin Great Dates. Harlequin Great Danes? I've never heard of that before. That's cool. Yeah, so they're the black and white Danes. Okay. With the spots. Or whatever. Okay. Um, and my mum being my mum, she decided when I was eight years old that I was old enough to take a six-month Dane to a puppy class. <laughs> Thanks, mum. <laughs> yeah, you know, the dog was taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> Sink or swim, right? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I did that, and it was, you know, just – kept taking puppies to class and then actually when I moved out and I got my first dog of course I I went back to the same lady um to get my dog trained and socialized I mean I'd already done it a few times but it's the socialization that was that I you know I knew was important mm -hmm. um and I just became fascinated by how different breeds reacted differently to different methods of training and I'm like well, why won't my dog do that? And their dog's doing it. Like, what What am I doing wrong? And I just, and so I, it was the curiosity mm -hmm. and it was the fascination. And uh, I've always had a passion for dogs. I, I've bred, I've competed in every dog sport there is out there and, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I'm never happier than when I'm working with my dogs. Yeah, you know, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm somebody who sits down Saturday night, do a Netflix binge or movie or whatever and you know halfway through i'm i'm like working with my dog like the movie's secondary like i'm like oh i'm gonna teach you this or <laughs> let's do, need to... or let's snuggle together on the couch or yeah you know, yeah yeah there's few things that put a smile on my face more than getting that snuggle with your pup yeah. how many dogs do you have marcia i am now down to one um yeah. I had the most I've had is five. I had five dogable does. Um, don't know if you recall the movie Turner and Hooch with Tom Hanks. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So my first dogable doe, that was a dog. That was actually two of them in, in the movie. Um, mm -hmm. years. Um, my first dogable doe, Tilk, was actually a grandson of Beasley, one of the dogs that played Hooch. You're kidding. No, true. Yeah, true. It was a grandson. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Small world. And is that what you have now? Is that your uh, one dog now? Passed away. I, I lost my last one 18 months ago. I had to oh, say just... goodbye. Um, and then I went slightly insane. Yeah. It, it ignored my own advice to all my clients and complete nutcase. Uh, I went and got a blue healer. A blue? A blue healer. Healer, okay. That's an Australian cattle dog. Full they of are... energy full of energy, high prey drive, and they are actually uh, a quarter dingo. A quarter dingo. Okay. So, so I went from the dog to Bordeaux, as I used to refer to them as locomotive couch potatoes, because they were basic couch potatoes, and unless there was something going on, and then it was a freight train and you went stopping it. Right. <laughs> There's right. no way you're stopping 156 pounds from doing anything <laughs> if it wanted to kind of thing and then i went and then i went to a, what i prefer to land out as a, a jet fighter pilot because he just doesn't he's all over the place everywhere he just doesn't stop yeah i know i um uh, my sister has uh is sorry so it's a blue healer and what's the mix it's uh it's a blue healer they're a pure breed oh they are they're also known as an australian cattle dog Okay, they're similar they to an Australian are, Shepherd. The blue healers, the ones that are blue, are a quarter dingo. So the Australian cattle dog, is that a similar to an Australian Shepherd? No. No. Very okay. 
Okay. They're still herding breeds, but yeah, one is very short coated, uh, very muscular, um, very much a high, high prey drive. You gotta keep them busy 24 seven or, or they will drive you insane. Um, whereas your Australian Shepherd, which is one of the breeds that I did actually own, um, they do like to herd, but it's it's not every single thing that moves. <laughs> okay, so the cattle dogs even more so. So I've dealt with yeah. border collies and I've dealt with Australian shepherds and they, the border collie, especially, it was just yeah. never ending, never yeah. ending. <laughs> yeah. I, I basically say, yeah, if you can handle a border collie, you could po probably handle a blue healer. It's, it's amazing. It's not, you're just going up a notch or two. <laughs> yeah. Which they're already up to the they're, they're most notch. Yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. Now you're going to level 11. Yeah. I love that story. So you've had dogs in your life, yeah. your whole, your whole life. And different different breeds and friends and family with different breeds and just just seeing how different dogs reacted to different environments and different things and I'm like oh well and the, you start to say, oh that's what they were bred to do right and then you go okay you know why does my border collie chase every car or bike or skateboarder or whatever going by because yeah. he's a herder. I'm sure my mother used to ask the same thing about me yeah. when I was younger. <laughs> Apparently I had a lot of energy, but why do you, I'm just so curious because I, um, buying my two pugs, I already liked animals, but through having those dogs, it, I grew into without a doubt, the people that knew me in my life, it went from a like to a, a deep love mm -hmm. for those dogs. I mean, I just love them. I had them for 10 years they're no longer here. And that was heartbreaking for me. Nothing like when my cats passed, it's felt like, you know, I don't have children, so I can't say, but like a real, real deep grieving uh, because there was such a deep love there. What do you think it is about dogs particularly? There's a lot of cat lovers out there and there's just a lot of animal lovers out there, but it seems to go up a notch with dogs. What do you think it is about dogs that human just connect so deeply with? It's their unconditional love of you. Yeah, it's gotta be it, right? That's, that's solely it. I mean, you walk in the door and they're like, oh my God, you're home. And you're like, I put the garbage out. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I was two minutes, if that, right? Yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had cats also in my life. I'm um, Siamese was mm -hmm. my breed of choice. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'd walk in, she'd be sunning herself in the window and my dogs are going, oh, great, mom, you're back, you're back. And she just used to look up and went, yeah. yeah. Oh, you're here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? They well, got that attitude. Siamese, they're very vocal. I, you know, I, I have conversations with her, and she meow, meow, meow back to me, and we'd have little chats and stuff like that. And they're an intelligent breed, so she learned to sit down, calm, drop it, take it, leave it. I mean, I trained the cat like I trained the dog, but when you walk in that door, she's like, "I," and the dogs are like, "Oh my God, you're home!" And yeah. I think that's it. I think that generally that's what it is. It's that. It's how they make you feel. Yeah, I, think, I mean, they pick up on your emotions. You you're feeling sad or down, and your dog just comes up and snuggles into you. It's like I'm here, feel better. It's amazing. I mean, I've I talked about this before um, with my team. I've written a few articles about connection, and I used uh, my dogs as an example. Um, they just have this awareness that yeah. sometimes us humans struggle to have, and it's almost like they see the bigger picture better than us. It's those small things, the little things in life that dogs care about. They are truly themselves. There's no fakeness about them. They're honest. They don't care about material wealth and insecurities. They just want to love and, and be loved and uh, know that they're supported and safe. And I don't know, I've learned a lot from my dogs when I really just wanted some cuddly pets. Um, they helped make me a better version of myself, which I was not expecting and probably went hand in hand with, with why I connected so deeply with them. They're incredible uh, animals. Yeah. If you did well with pugs as your first breed, I, I always tell my clients, every breed out there was bred to do a job and you've got to understand that. And some of them need to do that job. So you've got to fulfill that need in some shape or form. The so I only breed that was bred to sit there and look pretty. Yeah, I was going to say, what's a pug's job? Because that's all they did. Yeah. So if you're going to go French Bulldog, I will tell you, um, the lace makers, the lace makers in France. 
that's what they bred the French Bulldog for, to keep the rats and the mice away from the lace, but not be so high energy that they were tearing around, wrecking their lace that they were making. Mm, I didn't so know they can have a bit of a prey drive in them, which you go, whoa, why, why, why? Why, why, have, you, why have you gutted that toy in 30 seconds? Because I have a prey drive. Why have you got the, yeah, my pugs didn't do that, but uh, there's some a French. Of them, some of them don't, but there's a French bulldog in my life right now, and he's just he's just wonderful, and uh, I like them small like that, and uh, that's what I'm thinking about next. But I did not know that uh, that they have that that prey drive in them, they, definitely they more can. energy than my pug, but and still. they got the bulldog in them, so they can be a bit stubborn. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, myself and that dog will line up in that quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So myths and misconceptions. Uh, there are so many out there about training dogs. I mean, I used to think there's no way that I'm going to take my dog. Uh, like this is when I first got my dog. They've been passed for about five years now. I'm 37. So we're talking 15 years ago. I was 22. Didn't know anything about anything. And I said, there's no way I'm taking my dog to a trainer and they can get choked and they're kind of like forcing them to be trained. It, it seemed to me from the very, very little information that I had that it looked painful. It looked like not good. Um, so that's a, a misconception that I'm now aware of that comes up to me. But what kind of um, myths and misconceptions can you enlighten us with so that we have the correct information when it comes to dog training? So there, there still is a huge divide in methods that dog trainers use. Um, there still are the corrective trainers out there that will use a pinch collar, a shock collar, um, choke chains, um, and, and stuff like that, that, that can be quite harsh. There are still trainers that train that way out there. Um, it, it, it's doable, but, you know, that's not suitable for every person, definitely. And it's not suitable for every breed. I'm not saying there are breeds that need that. Um, I had the dog double dog. They they are a natural guard dog. They're aloof with strangers. They're over 150 pounds of solid muscle. They're incredibly stubborn. Um, I never did any aversive training with them whatsoever. And my boys became certified therapy dogs and child certified therapy dogs. At 150 pounds. Well, my wow. toughest was 176 pounds. And they had a gentleness about them to, to the point they, where they could yeah, be serious. We were, the, we were the epitome of the gentle giant. My females, on the other hand, were a little bit more territorial. Mm -hmm. And you've got to keep in mind they were breeding females. Right. Um, but that that misconception out there um, that training a dog has to be harsh, it, it's not. My little go-to that goes out with it that's in my logo is causing pain is no way to train. There's no need to, I mean, you get more results with honey than you do with vinegar. So I love that because I was just about to ask you, do they get more results? Uh, like if they're, if they're doing that, you call it adversive training? Yeah. Yeah. So if they're doing that, I imagine it was because they got results quicker. Uh, some people think that that way with their children. I mean, we've had generations of this before where we use force to try to influence that being to do what we want them to do, but you're saying, no, it's actually less effective and um, pain doesn't have to be a part of it. Pain does not have to be a part of it. I mean, not to take away from the trainers that do adhere to that because some of them get very good results um, and some of them do it correctly. Okay. You know, not just like, I'm just going to keep yanking you and, and smacking your nose and pulling on that collar until you comply. Some of them do do it the way it was originally meant to be done, which is a stern method of training. Mm -hmm. But those that are using the aversive, I, I, what I generally say to people is the dogs that are obeying out of fear. Yeah. What do you want your dog to do? Obey you out of fear about what you're going to do to him or obey you because he loves and trusts you and you've never hurt him. Same with people, right? Exactly. I mean, we just, I've never found it to be beneficial for a human anyways. I know much less about animals, but to have a constant fearful mindset, yeah. you're limiting that human being significantly, not to mention the stress of your life. Yeah. Um, so I love that you do that. I did not know that before bringing, uh, um, before you coming on the show, 
I'm very happy to hear that because we love our animals and yeah. we just can't picture this this image in our head of them being choked and, and being in pain um, because we send them there. We say we love them. They think uh, we love them. And then we're sending them away to be hurt in some way. So I really, really love that you do that and that you found it to be very effective. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I will from something just pick up on, on what you said about sending them away to be trained. Yeah, that's what I just assumed. No, yeah, I don't adhere to that. There, there are programs out there and trainers that offer board and train. But what I tell my clients is that trainer is teaching your dog to listen and respect them. Right. You need to earn your dog's trust and respect. So you need to train your dog. I teach you. I'll have it in the class. All, I'll have it in a group class all the time. They go, "Oh, you're training us," and then I go, "Well, that is my title. I am a certified professional dog training instructor. Um, I can take your dog and train your dog, and your dog will listen to me. Right. Will they listen to you? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. When push comes to shove, will they listen to you? Right. Um, so I, 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 you know, you need to come to class with your dog so your trainer can show you how to get your dog to comply with you. And every dog is different and every person is different and every technique is different. It's not, it's not a standard format, but I do, I do say, because there are trainers out there that, um, are what we say a hundred percent positive. They never tell their dog. No, oh. my logic is you can't teach anybody anything unless they understand when you're telling them, Yes, that's what I want you to do, or no, that's not what I want you to do. So we do use verbal corrections. You have to. You have, the you have consequences. To yeah, yeah, you do it wrong. You know, we do use verbal corrections. And yeah. when we're getting older and we're walking to heal, we will do what I call a leash pop, which is mean we will just go, ah, ah. And it's like... What I say to my clients, it's like if I walk up to you and I'm trying to get you to listen to me and you're, I'll tap you on the shoulder. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Yep. And then, excuse me. Hello. You're supposed to be paying attention to me. Yeah. So verbal and, and physical communication, yeah. um, not abuse or force. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I didn't even think about me being there. So now I'm curious. I'll get to the, the standard questions in a second here. Yeah. How long does that take? So I have a... My dog has a second vaccine, 10, 12 weeks, whatever it is. Okay. Um, and I want to get them trained well. So I come to you. And what does that look like for me? So you, uh, my courses are six weeks long. So you would, you would come once a week because you've got to have time to go home and practice what you learn in class and get it set in your dog. Mm -hmm. So I, I do puppy class. Beginner classes for those that didn't come to puppy and that haven't learned, you know, the foundations, or if you've brought in a rescue dog and you're not sure what they know or they don't know. Right. Um, then intermediate and then advanced. And then I do offer classes like canine good citizen and therapy dog prep work. Um, I do work with clients that want to get their dog um, as a service dog or as an assistance dog. And of course they have to be task trained, but the foundation of obedience needs to be there. So if you want a well-behaved dog that you can to walk and take anywhere, you're going to go right up to advanced. And it's so that when we do our behaviorists, um, the uh, professional, animal, uh, so, uh, professional Animal Behaviorist Association um, did a study. And who, had, who has the best behaved dogs? Who has a dog that has zero issues? And we looked at oh well my dog's got to this level but he does this or my dog only went to this level and he doesn't do anything um but the, the um idea of or well, the results where it's not what you trained your dog to do it's how often you trained your dog ah, okay. so what we found out is if you part if you get into a system of formal training once every six months for the first four years of your dog's life, and it doesn't matter if it's a, a, an intermediate, an advanced, a rally class, a agility course, a scent tracking course, it doesn't matter. It gets you into that. I'm going to step back up to the plate and I'm going to follow the rules and I'm going to, you know, 
get back into sit means sit, not lay down and follow, 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 follow the rules and reinforce it. So what you did is every six months you stepped up to the plate and you started doing your job, which is to be the boss, the alpha, the leader, however you want to term that mum, dad, however you want to term that rank. And as the dog's gone through puppy brain into teenage brain and into adult brain, you keep stepping up, you keep stepping up and they go, oh, well, yes, you, you do know how to do your job which is tell me what I should and shouldn't be doing, look after me and protect me and keep me, you know, have a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what you're looking at with training. It's not the level you train to, it's how frequently you train to get that. Because when the results came in, we had dogs that had a million titles of all different sports and obedience on them, but still would yell out the window at anybody or anything walking down the street and the owner couldn't get them to stop. Yeah. Yeah. This is an obedience champion. <laughs> because they went, oh, well, I'm going to do this, this, this class, this class, this class, get that. Done. Okay, you're 18 months old. I'm done training you. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like humans, right? Yeah. I was uh, a fitness trainer for uh, about 15 years or so. I'm still in that industry in uh, lesser capacities. Yeah. But it's conditioning. Uh, yeah. If you, we, we have it. If you don't use it, you lose it, right? I mean, right. if you stop studying French, uh, and then five years later, you want to pick it up. Yeah, you'll probably have some memory of some things, but you've that lost a huge portion right. of that skill. So if you think about athletes, think about yeah. gymnasts. Does she just learn how to do it all and never train again? No. no. So, yeah. Practicing, they keep training, doing the same things again and again and again. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. You've simplified it to the point of, you know, what's worked with humans when developing a new skill. Treat your animals the same way. Yeah. And do it for them and for yourself. I mean, it, it benefits both parties. Um, no, I love that. I appreciate yeah. you clearing that up for us. I do for my, my clients when we're in class. Um, I always try and give them a human equivalent. I could load you up with all the scientific words that we use when we're talking about canine behavior and dog training. And I just break it down into layman's terms. Mm -hmm. It's like, my two dogs are fighting over something. And, you know, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, well, if it was two two-year-old children, what would you do? All right. Oh, well, the one that was causing the problem, I'd give them a timeout. I'd remove them from the situation. I'd tell them, I'm like, okay, so what do your dogs? Yeah, yeah. No, it's when we, can, when we can simplify things down to a level of understanding that we all get and we use metaphors and analogies that relate back to our own life, it's like, oh, light bulb. Yeah. This is a different species, but. That's my favorite. Just to, see the, just to see the light bulb go off in my yeah. client's eyes. I'm just yeah. like, dang it. Yeah. Yeah, treat them the same way. That's great. Um, outside of business, Marcia, we love the we love to talk about fun. Yeah. Life is not just business. I look at business as just a category of life, but life is the main game that I'm playing. It's the main arena that I'm in, and we need to have some fun. So, yeah. what do you do outside of work for fun, Marcia? Work with my dogs. Yeah, yeah, I figured. <laughs> I figured that. Yeah, when you said the Netflix example, I'm like. She's probably with her dogs all the time. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh, I, I love to garden. I'm, you know, I love to do the gardening. And uh, Javi and I are very much uh, big DIYers. Oh, um, very cool. So, yeah. you know, we, we like to do that. So we do projects around the house. Um, funny story on that. I was painting and with five Bordeaux running around the house, of course, they're going to brush up against the freshly painted wood or wall. And now you have dog hair and prints in your paint. And a dog that's got paint on him and needs a bath. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, my son had a toy that was a, a little wind up elephant. And for some reason, <laughs> it was only about 10 inches big, but for some reason, my mastiffs were terrified of it. <laughs> so in our painting cupboard is this elephant, because when we paint a room or a wall, I just stick it in the doorway and they won't go anywhere near that room. That's your guard elephant. That's my guard elephant. To your 150 plus pound dogs. <laughs> yeah. So I just thought that was that was that was funny. That's one of my funny stories because yeah. it used to trumpet and they back up and go, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> so DIY, you and the husby, uh, hubby, you, yeah. you like getting into your gardens and then you're spending a great deal of time with your dogs. It's It very much seems like it's not a business to you. This is a lifestyle. This it's is a passion. purpose. Yeah. yeah passion it's a passion it's a passion so i'm i'm privileged enough to be able to work my passion my husband supported me in it um which is great 
Yeah, no, that is that is fantastic. Outside of the fun things, we really like to shine a light on uh, humans' hardships, trials and tribulations, because I feel like it's being talked about more these days. We have more yeah. significant influencers um, that are out there, speakers, business people, personal development people, whatever it is. People with platforms are talking more about the value of discussing and sharing our hardships. There's a litany of reasons. So we like to be a part of that trend. Uh, because I know through my hardships in life, something that I used to be embarrassed about or ashamed of before, because I didn't know what I didn't know. And they're all rooted in insecurities. And then I got great mentors and they kind of revealed um, uh, this new world uh, to me to wear these as kind of a, a badge of honor in a way. And to, by example, showing other people that our hardships are part of our human experience and anything a part of our human experience is real and should not be tamped down and, and ashamed of. So uh, I really find that that's where the growth is for us yeah. human beings is when you're doing things that you're comfortable all the time, there's some good there for sure. But it's often when we butt up against that large obstacle, we don't have the answer for. Now we're given the opportunity to find an answer or to find out how capable we are. So we share our hard things on the show. And I like to ask the guests, is there any trials and tribulations, hardships that you'd be willing to share with us that when you went through it in the moment, it probably didn't feel good. It probably sucked a fair bit. But when you look back now in hindsight, you don't regret that. You wouldn't remove that ingredient from your life because it helped you live the life that you're living today. Anything come to mind? I, I suppose the biggest one would be um, obviously born and raised and educated in England, as you can tell from my accent. Um, my first marriage ended uh, in divorce yeah. um, because my husband was having an affair. I suppose I spent too much time with the dogs and not enough time with him. <laughs> um, and my parents and uh, sister had already immigrated to Canada. Um, so I, I, I packed my bags. Um, I had to rehome my dogs, which was yeah. heartbreaking, and, and came to Canada and went through the culture shock and, and the differences in words. And I was a single, single parent for seven years. Um, and just at, at 26 years old, my whole world crumbled around me that my whole plans, my, my whole life plan, it just went out the window. And I literally started from zero again at 26 with a two year old. Um, so I understand that kind of heartbreak and stuff and been through that and how scary it can be. Um, to do that. And then I suppose that's the, that's the biggest one. Um, and the other one is, is, you know, a lot more people are talking about it these days. Um, but my, I, my mother had mental issues. And so there's a lot of childhood stuff that's there. Um, sure. and I, I probably say that was a big contributor to me just getting so attached to dogs because that's where the unconditional love came from was from yeah. the dogs. No matter, yeah. you know, if I screwed up, if, if they didn't care. Yeah. So maybe that's, that's why my personal story is, you know, childhood survivor of not great, too great parenting. <laughs> And then having your your entire life just swept, done, dumped, and having to come back from that. Yeah. Well, first, I appreciate you sharing that with us. Uh, super meaningful story. And I imagine those were very difficult times. Can I ask you, how do you think, either or, or both, how do you think they shaped you going forward? I mean, at 26, I can't imagine doing that. Um, I don't know what it's like growing up that way when you were a child. But uh, a lot of my challenges came uh, through, all throughout my life, but really in my 20s is when I really kind of veered off course and got my ass kicked. Um, but especially coming to a new country on your own with a child at that young of age, I mean, um, I'm, I'm pushing off having children a little bit. I, I don't think there's a higher order for a man than to be a father yeah. for a woman. I think creating a human being is our most important work, I would say. And I don't have them yet at 27. I couldn't imagine at 26. So you would have been 24 when you had your child. Yeah. 
how do you think that uh, shaped you later on in life, that challenging situation? Um, for, for the longest time, I was very emotionally blocked off. Just, just from everybody, because if I uh, let my emotion show, I was saying I was weak. Right. The only ones that I could break down and cry and have panic attacks around was the dogs, because they're the only ones that didn't judge me for that. So um, it took me a long time to actually let the people that I was meeting and became friends in my life, let me know, let them know about, you know, my upbringing and don't, you know, you have to be strong. Don't show your emotions. Right. Put it, keep that wall up because you, you just can't take that wall down. Um, so I do show my emotions more. more. That's clear <laughs> to me. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm 60 next year <laughs> and I've only, only just in the last like five years, mm -hmm. um, been more open. I spoke to them and they've gone, really? I never knew. I never knew that you went through that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this, this, this talk that's, you know, it's now, um, acceptable to say that, mm -hmm. you know, um, we, in England, it, it's different. Everything stays within the family. You mm -hmm. don't tell anybody outside. You don't. You just don't speak about it. That's that was very prevalent when I was growing up and and into my twenties and stuff like that. It was still a very prevalent thing. It was you know obvious to everybody in the entire family that she had mental issues. But you don't see a psychiatrist. You don't go to the doctor. That's a no no. You don't yeah people outside of the family about it yeah i think it's a great time to be alive for for a number of reasons but that's one of them i mean if if you don't address the problem you exacerbate it and people yeah. are limiting themselves to the quality of life they can live and you just being able to share that i mean at the very least i see strength from that because that's a hard thing to do and if you're doing a hard thing you have to have strength you have to be capable but courage to show that um people that are sharing that care less about other people's judgment and more about being who they really are, yeah. which is a beacon for the rest of us um, that are so um, limited by our insecurities and our fear of other people's judgment. Essentially you're living in fear when you don't own your own life. Yeah. So you being able to share that with us um, and this, these conversations being had more is creating a, a space for people to find out what they're capable of and empowering people. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, definitely my, you know, my girlfriend's group when, you know, one of us opens up and we listen and go, well, this happened to me and you're just going, yeah, you know, every single one of us in, in this group, it, it, it's, it's strange. Every single one of us in my group had, had, had an abusive childhood in some form or another. And I'm like, I think this is why we are friends. Although we didn't know that when we became friends, it yeah. was that outward mentality to life it was you know all those little ticks mm -hmm. um and so yeah it's 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 quite funny we, we joking that we're, we're all a bunch of crazy old ladies <laughs> well you've been shaped in similar ways it's no wonder that you found common ground with each other yeah um i think i think it's so great humans are my passion uh, i definitely love animals but the more i learn about humans from speaking to them the more i learn about myself and it kind of narrows my path for living a higher quality life. It simplifies things and I don't get caught up in my own kind of limited thinking and insecurities um, by learning more about other people. So I really appreciate uh, you sharing that with us. That was, uh, yeah, you, really you have to, as you know, just my passion for dogs, obviously there and why I do my job, but I'm working with the people. That's true. So yeah. I have to be very good at understanding where they're coming from, understanding their struggles, and stuff like that and I, I have a history of working yeah. that out myself so yeah that's to a be great a way to do good it dog training instructor you need to be very good with people and very good with dogs yeah and I, at the end of the day you're instructing those people too i mean you're kind of the lighthouse showing them the way um and people are complicated 
you yeah. put a bunch of different personalities in the room. And like yeah. you said, everyone is different. Every style of training is different. Oh, I think that's great. And you probably get a great idea about human behavior by doing what you do. It seems like you're addressing animal behavior, uh, but I would say just as equal, maybe more human behavior. Yeah. Yeah. You've got, you've got to, you've got to know how humans tick. I think the, the biggest, the biggest one that I always like correcting my clients on is how many times are you going to ask your dog to sit? Right. <laughs> right. And so yeah. of course I, I, I think when you're laughing, you know, um, it, it, it's been said before that those of us that have, have, have suffered childhood trauma, those are the comedians. <laughs> Could be, yeah. Um, so, you know, I get my clients laughing in class and, and stuff like that. You know, you'll um, catch you like a third or fourth time. And I'll just walk up to you and go, oh, I'm sorry, you didn't tell me Timmy was deaf. It's not deaf. I'm like, oh. I just thought you thought he couldn't hear you because you told him to sit seven times. And then they just look at me and start laughing. Yeah. I mean, humor is a great medicine, right? We all yeah. love it. Yeah. I do use a lot of humor in my class. I, I think you learn more and pay more attention if you can put some humor into it and if yeah. you can relate it to a human experience. Yeah. Yeah. What is one thing you wish our listeners knew about the dog nanny in particular? I'm slightly insane. <laughs> well, now they know that. <laughs> Anything um, on top of that? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I, I can work with anybody. Um, I, I have been known to have the patience of a saint. Um, yeah. I teach with humor. Mm -hmm. um, I will always give you different examples. I've worked with every breed out there. I've worked with every personality out there. Um, every disability out there. Um, I've worked a lot with people with disabilities because mm -hmm. there's certain things they just can and cannot do. Um, so right from working with children and getting children to, to know what to do, um, right up to the seniors to, you know, I can't bend over, the dog can't pull me, I can't hold the leash. Yeah. So I, I'm very adaptive because I've I've adapted so many different times for so many different reasons. So no matter the issue, no matter your circumstance, I'm sure if you're having a problem with your dog, I can help you. Beautiful. I love it. So if you got a dog and you want to train it, call Marcia, the dog nanny. And speaking of that is how can people connect with you? What's um, the best way? You can go to my website, which is just dognanny.ca. Okay. Um, I do have a Facebook page. It's the Dog Nanny's Canine Training Academy. So you contact me through there. I'm on Google Maps, and you could message me through Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's a couple of molding media things. And if you just do a Google search, the dog trainers in Innisfil or Barry or Simcoe County, I'm, I'm on the first page. Beautiful. And is it the Dog Nanny on the first page, or is Canine in there? What any it's other one? That is Canine Training Academy. But if you just do the dog nanny, you will get it. There's only one. That actually, there's two of us in Canada. Hmm. One is in BC. Okay, so you don't want to go to BC, Simcoe County. Type in the dog nanny, you'll get to where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was lovely having you on the show, Marcia. I learned so much, and that's one of my favorite reasons for doing this. But I'm sure the audience had similar questions to what I had about training our dogs about your story and uh thank you for for letting us in as much as you did um all valuable information a lot of beauty um to those stories as well and it was just great talking to you thanks for coming on the show i do and thank you for having me on absolutely thank you for listening to the good neighbor podcast neighbors to nominate your favorite local businesses to be featured on the show go to gnpmidhurst.com that's gnpmidhurst.com or call 705-413-3775.